Welcome to this public round table on remembering empire and contesting statues. My name is Megan Tinsley and I'm from the University of Manchester and I'm one of the organizers of Movements at Manchester's conference on alternative futures and popular protest alongside Simon Fede, Kevin Gillen, Miro Vukovic and Luke Yates who is co-facilitating this session. Uh, the conference has been running for the past three days and this is its final event. This roundtable is also supported by the School of Social Sciences Making a Difference campaign. The subject of the discussion, uh, and indeed the name of the roundtable, not set in stone, links it to the changing shape of cultural activism, um, an ESRC-funded project at CODE, the Center on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, led by Gary Young, alongside Sadia Habib, Chloe Peacock, Ruth ramston Carlsey, and myself. Uh, I should also note that CODE is currently conducting the EVEN survey, uh, which will tell the lived experiences of COVID-19 for ethnic and religious minorities, providing powerful evidence to affect change. Uh, you can take the survey at www.evensurvey.ac.uk. So before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, the roundtable will last two hours. After the introductions, each of the participants will speak for around 10 minutes. Next, they'll have the chance to respond to one another, uh, and I'll pose a few questions to the participants at large, and then we'll open up the discussion to everyone. So if you have a question for the presenters, please either type it in the Zoom chat uh, or use the Q&A feature. Uh, we won't be moderating the chat on YouTube, uh, so apologies to those who are watching the live stream. <clears throat> a year ago, uh, following the murder of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter protests spread across the world and brought renewed attention to movements calling for the removal of statues of slavers and colonizers. That summer, activists highlighted the connections between commemorating the past and constructing the present, between slavery and state violence, and between imperialism and institutional racism. Toppling Colston and demanding that roads must fall were also calls to decolonize institutions and public space. But the protests were also multivocal and their reception has been hotly contested. Between June 2020 and January 2021, 30 statues in Britain were removed from public space. Councils in London, Manchester, Leeds, and elsewhere held consultations on diversity in the public realm. Anti-racist activists crowdsourced research on the material legacies of slavery and empire, problematizing sites that had been part of ordinary and uninterrogated cityscapes. At the same time, self-proclaimed statue defenders held their own demonstrations, in one instance greeting Churchill's statue in Parliament Square with Nazi salutes. MPs have proposed, proposed building more statues, uh, perhaps of Victoria Cross winners. The Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, Robert Jenrick, has sought to make it more difficult to remove statues, and the government has adopted an official policy of retain and explain. As I speak, the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill is making its way through Parliament, with clauses that would uh, make damaging a statue punishable by up to 10 years in prison. And so a year after Colston was toppled and just weeks after Oriel College Oxford announced that it would not remove roads, this roundtable provides an opportunity to reflect on the movement and its future. Why do anti-racist movements contest statues? How do they help activists to, achieve, to frame their goals? How does contesting statues prevent, present new opportunities for solidarity and new forms of opposition? What are the promises and pitfalls of toppling statues, of creatively altering them, of engaging with local government and institutions? And how have the answers to these questions changed in the past year? We have five esteemed speakers joining us for this discussion. Uh, all of them have been thinking about and speaking back to statues in different ways, and I'm really looking forward to their contributions. Um, I'll introduce them all now uh, in the order in which they'll be speaking. Simukai Chiguru is Associate Professor of African Politics in the Oxford Department of International Development and Fellow of St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He is the author of The Political Life of an Epidemic, Cholera, Crisis, and Citizenship in Zimbabwe, an examination of the social and political causes and consequences of Zimbabwe's catastrophic cholera outbreak in 2008 and 2009, the worst in African history. This monograph has just won the Theodore J. Lowy First Book Award from the American Political Science Association. More generally, Simukai is interested in the social politics of inequality in Africa. He has conducted research in Zimbabwe, Uganda, the Gambia, and Tanzania, and has publications in several leading social science journals and medical journals. As a student, Simukai was one of the founders of Roads Must Fall Oxford, of which he writes, 
our goal was to slay the racist ideologies that still hold sway in various disciplines, to bring more black people into academia at every level, and to end the glorification of the men who had dedicated their lives to advancing the colonial project. Uh, so our second speaker, Inas Bakiet, is co-facilitator of the Roads Must Fall movement in Oxford, which aims to decolonize the space, the curriculum, and the institutional memory of the university. She holds a BA in politics and philosophy from the University of Manchester, where she was president of the Action Palestine Student Society. She's currently studying the MSc in environmental governance at the University of Oxford, researching the intersections between environment, society, and political economy. Our third speaker, Joanna Birch Brown, is senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Bristol. She has contributed to campaigns to change how Bristol memorializes figures like Edward Colston and to help Bristol acknowledge and understand its historic role in transatlantic slavery. She has a particular interest in bridging between different viewpoints and promoting understanding of the positive intentions of people on all sides. In her role as co-chair of the We Are Bristol History Commission, Joanna is directing Bridging Histories, a summer long learning program teaching resource for communities facing issues of contested heritage. She's also part of the team who are writing guidelines for public bodies across the UK, carrying out reviews of contested statues and street names. Our fourth speaker, Alastair Doggart, is an activist who was involved in the removal of Edward Colston's statue in Bristol. He is the founder of the Bristol 18, realizing creative projects to raise funds for grassroots educational organizations, teaching anti-racism and history outside of the national curriculum. He has recently featured in the BBC Radio 4 series, Descendants, which explores people connect, people's connections to slavery and how shared history links us together. Last but not least, Gary Young is professor of sociology at the University of Manchester. He was previously a columnist and editor at large of The Guardian. Throughout his career, both his journalism and books have covered social movements in general and the civil rights movement in particular, inequality, race, immigration, identity, and politics. He's currently concentrating his research on the Black presence in post-war Europe. Currently a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, he is also an Alfred Nobler Fellow of Type Media in the US and an editorial board member of The Nation magazine. His most recent piece in The Guardian and his Anna and Bevan lecture at the Hay Festival argued that we need more honesty and fewer statues. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, with all of that said, uh, welcome to all the participants, uh, welcome to uh, the audience members, um, and I will turn it over to Simokai. Um, thanks so much for that uh, kind introduction and for this invitation. Really is a privilege to be speaking on um, this panel with such a, a wonderful and eclectic array of speakers. Um, so I wanted to just start with something of a reminder from the British historian Christopher Hill, who tells us that history has to be rewritten in every generation. Because although the past does not change, the present does. And each generation asks new questions of the past, finds new areas of sympathy as it relives different aspects of the experiences of its predecessors. So I arrived in Oxford in 2013 uh, to begin postgraduate degrees in African history and politics. This was a really exciting new intellectual experience for me. My previous training had been in medicine and it was the first time I got to sit with and consume um, books and lectures and articles um, that centered the experiences and intellectual contributions of Africans. And at the same time, it was a bit strange doing this in Oxford because in the classroom, we were studying the horrors of colonialism. We took disturbing historical tours into the country of my birth, Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia, where my father had been a liberation fighter and had been um, locked up by Rhodesian forces for his anti-colonial politics, later exiled from the country, where my, father, where my grandfather had been lynched by Rhodesian officers also for his politics. And so the kind of history of Rhodesian white nationalism and anti-colonialism was very much a part of my personal history, and then later my intellectual journey. And at the same time, I was studying this in an institution that kind of unabashedly venerates its colonial past. Oxford, for any of you who have visited it, is strewn with tributes to the great men of empire, to slave traders, imperial marauders, and colonial warmongers. To survive in Oxford, wrote the philosopher Nikhil Krishnan, is to look at its skyline of memorialized villains and to say such beauty. 
There really is no escaping it once you start to look. But colonialism shapes Oxford in less material and less concrete ways too. Hugh Trevor Roper, for over a quarter of a century, held Oxford's most prestigious history chair. He infamously pronounced in the, in the 60s that there was no history in Africa, only the history of Europeans in Africa. The rest is darkness. Before Europeans brought history to Africa and, place, and places like it, Trevor Roper went on, there was merely the unedifying gyrations of barbarous tribes in picturesque but irrelevant corners of the globe. Now, we might think that such uh, ideas are outdated and belong only to old fogies like Trevor Roper. And yet I'm often stunned at the frequency with which such ideas are reproduced and adapted to the idioms of the 21st century. And so in my early days as a master's student, the idea of changing Oxford, of decolonizing such a place seemed absurd, kind of like deboning a skeleton to invoke Nikhil Krishnan again. I think for me, this began to change one night in early December of 2014. By this stage, I finished my master's degree and I was at the end of my first term as a PhD student. I attended a special event at the Oxford Union Debating Society that marked the 50th anniversary of Malcolm X's um, address um, at Britain's most famous debating society. 1964, Malcolm X defended the motion, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice and moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Half a century later, the relevance of this motion was yet again debated, but this time with the likes of Angela Davis and Cornell West assuming Malcolm X's position. Now I'm not gonna talk about the debate itself, but something that happened during the debate. About midway through, um, I began to notice everybody looking at their phones. Now, this was especially striking because um, on this occasion, the union made its chamber accessible to um, non-members of the debating society. And as such, it was filled from the kind of the balcony down to the debating floor with Oxford's black community. And we were collectively distracted by the breaking news that in Richmond County, New York City, a grand jury had decided not to indict uh, Daniel Pantaleo, the police officer who had choked Eric Garner to death back in July of 2014. And I think this was the first time that I really registered the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Um, as riots would go on to erupt in the United States, many of my white friends in Oxford were indifferent to the verdict, but were disgusted by the looting of property and damage to local businesses. And so, here I was felt caught between past and present and between ge geographies. As anti-racism erupted in the US, we were still caught in this kind of colonial time warp where the only thing that mattered was pres preserving a certain kind of a white conception of liberal order. Now, talking about race in the UK, I found can be tiresome. I've long understood what uh, the historian David Olusoga calls the fundamental law of racial physics that operates in, more, in modern Britain. Now, the terms of this law are simple. They state that a white person or institution accused of racism has suffered more than a black person who has been the victim of racism. Um, in so many encounters in my time of, at Oxford, whenever I've spoken about how colonialism has shaped Britain's intellectual, aesthetic and material envi um, environments, how colonialism has codified whiteness as superior and universal, I've been accused of whinging. And yet watching black lives um, erupt in the US and gain global traction, I felt increasingly emboldened as a graduate student. The movement might have started as a civic campaign against police brutality in America's carceral state. And yet it was also an idea, a political critique of racism as both structural and historically produced, not merely a matter of individual conduct, morality or bad taste. And at the same time across the Atlantic from the US, another um, anti-racist movement was afoot. In March, 2015, um, Chumani Maxwelle hurled a bucket of shit at a statue of Cecil John Rhodes at the University of Cape Town's Rondenbosch campus. Now actually beginning in 2005, black students at UCT had been demanding the removal of this statue, but it wasn't until it was desecrated so dramatically that the campaign seized global attention and became known under the moniker Rhodes Must Fall. 
I think for me, the link between Black Lives Matter in the US and Roads Must Fall in South Africa threw into sharp relief everything I had been feeling about Oxford. And this was true of a number of my fellow Black students. So in the summer of 2015, the end of my first year as a PhD student, I became a founding member of the activist group Roads Must Fall in Oxford. Now there were dozens of us, black and brown students from around the university, some of whom born in Britain, others in Britain's former colonies. African-American students who similarly saw links between a decolonial or anti-colonial politics, as well as the anti-racism activism that was kicking off anew in the US. And of course, a number of white students. Um, our goal, as Megan had already introduced, was to tackle racist ideologies in the university as they held sway in academic disciplines, in the kind of body politic of the university, and in the relentless glorification of the imperial project. A few months of minor protests then culminated in uh, November 2015 in a demand to remove the statue of Cecil John Rhodes that sits um, at Oriel College's anterior facing edifice. We asked that the statue be taken down and housed in a museum. Um, this we demanded was, um, we condemned the statue, I should say, as an open glorification of the racist and bloody project of British colonialism. And as people gathered outside Oriel College, they chanted in call and response fashion, roads must fall, take it down. Clearly, a very short period of time, we stoked the ire of numerous public figures. To many, we were historically illiterate young ideologues intent on erasing the past, shutting down debate and subjecting complicated historical figures to anachronistic moral judgments. Now, I always thought these claims were strange. For a start, statues are not some objective or immutable record of the past. If anything, as Gary has written, they petrify historical discourse. Rhodes himself was obsessed with his own commemoration. I mean, this guy had a comic book level of narcissism. He wanted statues, scholarships, buildings, and even countries named after him, and for his legacy to last for over 4,000 years. At best, we can say that Rhodes's statue is a propagandist account of history. It was Rhodes who erased the past by building a fortune from exploited African labor and presenting it to Oxford University as munificence. Statues like his tell a story of, colonial, of colonialism as adventure and ambition and achievement, and not as a system of racial subjugation that continues to shape disparities in wealth, social status and resources in Southern Africa today. But besides all of that, our point in Rhodes Must Fall was never to weigh the soul of Rhodes himself, but to change the soul of our institution. Now, I couldn't really understand why so many politicians and public intellectuals were invested in keeping the statue in place. Even preeminent thinkers on the left who normally wouldn't associate themselves with nationalism, kind of betrayed a sort of romantic idea of how Britain under colonialism um, had shaped the modern world. We might think of this as a kind of colonial or imperial nostalgia despite itself. And so we had the likes of Will Hutton writing in The Guardian in 2015, that were it not for the legacies of the British Empire, South Africa would descend into unaccountable despotism as embodied by then President Jacob Zuma. It was, Hutton said, um, Britain who had bequeathed to South Africa the courts, rule of law, free press, freedom of association, and freedom of expression. Seems a particularly odd claim when we consider the history of apartheid South Africa. Even the celebrated Cambridge classicist Mary Beard fell into this trap and accused students like myself of erasing history while encouraging us to look at the Rhodes statue with a cheery and self-confident sense of unbatterability. So it quickly occurred to me at some point that these arguments were never about history, claiming so as entirely disingenuous. We were arguing about the deeper and often unarticulated meanings attached to symbols of Britain's imperial legacy. This was only amplified by the way we were depicted in the media. At times we were called pathetic snowflakes that lacked the tenacity to tolerate contradictory views. At other times we were demagogic iconoclasts, um, a horrid melange of enemies from old and new wars. Uh, I tried to total this up. I think we were called fascists, Maoists and equated to ISIS. But the irony here was that the people who complained 
that we were erasing history, or better yet, whitewashing history, were the same people who were unable to confront that the history of colonialism cannot be reduced to generous be uh, bequeathments or munificence, whether the, and whether we think about that in public debate or academic syllabuses. Those who criticized Rhodes Must Fall were the same who evaded the politics of race and anti-colonialism and dismissed student protests as youthful petulance and emotional fragility. I've long suspected that they knew as well as we did that taking down the statue would invite further challenges to the cultural, political and material benefits of empire in contemporary Britain. In 2016, Oriel College reneged on a pledge to launch a listening exercise to explore the fate of the statue, potentially with a view to taking it down. At the time, it felt as if the energy in Rhodes Must Fall had dissipated. We would later learn that Oriel backtracked on any engagement with the movement because it feared losing donor gifts from its moneyed old boys network. So much for debate. In April 2016, just before returning to Southern Africa for a period of fieldwork, I attended an event in London, um, a reading with the Nigerian American writer Teju Cole. During the uh, Q&A session, the question of statues and anti-colonialism was raised. Um, I recounted to Teju Cole um, how Britain had reacted to Rhodes Must Fall. And he said to me, don't give up. This is just a white establishment's hostility to post-colonial assertions of self. Post-colonial assertions of self. I like that a lot. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Simukai. There's a lot that, uh, that I hope we pick up on uh, in the discussion um, there. A wonderful start to the uh, panel. Uh, so I'll hand it over um, now to Inas, over to you. Uh, you're on mute, Ines. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I'm saying that basically it's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to hearing everybody speak and it's amazing to hear Timukai's account of his past uh, experiences with Rosemus Fall because at the moment I joined five years after Simukai started Rosemus Fall, so there's this kind of yeah, there's this time gap and so much has happened, yet so little has happened as well. <laughs> and so it's very fascinating just to kind of see these ups and downs. And I think, you know, this up and down definitely uh, entails and expresses my experiences with Rose Must Fall. Because, so I joined when I started my master's program uh, in October. And, you know, at that point, there was, you know, it was after a huge momentum from the summer, so the so-called Freedom Summer, um, where people from the previous RMF chapter um, had kind of rallied together and mobilized people, not just from the university, but from the city as well, among the Black Lives Matter protests to hold Oriel College and Oxford University accountable. And so going to the streets, doing sit-ins and workshops and um, kind of occupying the streets of Oxford to say, look, we're here. Five years later, we're still here and we need things to change. And we need you to also take accountability and um, address the racial history that Oxford University is still benefiting from. And so, when kind of, you know, as a result of these protests, Oriel College committed to taking the statue down. And of course that felt like a huge win for Rose Must Fall because we thought finally, finally after all this time we are being listened to and change is gonna happen, change is coming. And a lot of the work that, and so then since then an independent commission um, was uh, set up by Oriel College to look into what it means to take down the statue and kind of how, how that process will look like. And so that was very promising for us. And a lot of the work that 
has happened since I've joined has been on trying to also mobilize this and to again bring attention to the commission and Oriel that this is that this is very important and the decision and the recommendation that comes out of it is how it holds huge significance and so then it was a huge shock to hear the news two weeks ago that uh, Oriel College actually backtracked on its initial uh, decision to take the statue down. And so, and, and this moment was an up and down as well. The uh, day before on Wednesday, the 26th, we receive a call from The Guardian and they tell us that uh, they, that there's a leak in the report and <laughs> they have, they have the uh, commission's uh, decision in the end. And this is something also that we've been waiting for months. So initially it was, it was meant to, we were meant to hear towards the end of last year and it kept getting delayed over and over and over again. And then we hadn't even known that it was meant to come out until the Guardian called us and said that they have it in their hands and that the recommendation is to take the statue down. And so of course we were absolutely we were excited and we thought finally, again, okay, thing, th th this is, you know, really a result of us coming together and this is very legitimate and legitimized also all of our efforts. And then the next day on Thursday the 27th, and then we find out, well, just even though the commission recommends that the session should be taken down, we're not gonna listen to that. We're actually gonna take back our, our word. And, and this is something that Rose Must Fall has suffered from, from the very beginning since Sumukai started, that there has been so much pushback, so many attempts from Oreo College and the institution to delay and to demoralize the movement and to stop students, yeah, to kind of also push them into burnout as well, because that's something I think a lot of people forget that being an activist is extremely exhausting and especially when it is something that relates to your core being as well you know as black students fighting for black liberation and being pushed back at each step that you take and particularly when you think that you're making progress and the university and Oriel are very they know exactly what they're doing they know what they're doing and they benefit from it and that's how they've been able to sustain this kind of lack of commitment and inability to take accountability for such a long time despite all of the attention from uh, abroad and from kind of uh, students time and time again. Um, something I was mentioning uh, earlier was that you know each because we're, it's a student association uh, movement, each year the kind of the members change. And that's something I feel, you know, makes it a bit difficult as well for the movement because the university or a college uh, monopolized off of this. And so, you know, they made the decision last year that they were going to take it down and they have the independent commission. And so all of that work that had gone in from members from the previous uh, chapter kind of you know then we were left to pick that up and so movements need a lot of kind of stability and also this momentum going on and that's why it is I think very important for Rosemus Fall and for Black Liberation to think about the bigger picture that the movement is bigger than Oxford is bigger than the statue. Um, and that's why at the moment with Rose Must Fall, we are looking to also take, to obviously pay attention and target the statue coming down, but also expanding where our efforts are going towards and kind of looking at the, you know, the kind of fact that Rose must fall, the decolonization movement is more than roads. It's more than that, and it always has been. And, but I think this fight, 
you know, back and forth with decisions, it's very distracting and it's so consuming. And I think as a movement, we need, yeah, we're taking a step back to say, okay, we need to realign and kind of target again, the, the core pillars of what this move of decolonization. And that means looking at the curriculum and at staff, but also within the city as well. So I actually grew up in Oxford um, and it was, it's not North Oxford, so it's not where the university is, is situated. It's in East Oxford and it's a very, very different part of Oxford that actually most students never ever venture into. And before coming here, I didn't realize the level of elitism and prestige that hide behind these huge walls that you can never see, look, past and so you know this is a very 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 significant element of the movement that you know situating it within the city as well which has huge inequality it's actually one of the highest kind of disproportionate rates of inequality within the UK and that's shocking considering how much intellectual and monetary wealth sits here and so this is, yeah, this is kind of where Rosemont's Fall is going towards and we're putting that effort there. And, you know, as Simikai ended his speech, we won't give up. We'll never give up. And even if I'm not here, the movement won't give up. And I think, and I think that's what's very beautiful about Rosemont's Fall. You know, it, it, even though it changes, it is picked up and it's, it's embellished even more by people's different experiences and insights. And that's all I'll say. Thank you, Ines. Um, it's so interesting to hear about the specific dynamics of the movement and to place it within the bigger picture. Um, looking forward to picking up on that in the discussion. Uh, so now over to our third speaker, uh, Joanna. Hi, yes, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and in such wonderful company. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the privilege of, of this evening. Um, I suppose I wanna say, I guess I'm gonna share a few lessons from my experience in Bristol as, as an activist, as an academic, as a um, increasingly working within institutions and basically tell a pretty hopeful story. So I think this is a moment of incredible possibility for change. Um, the real question that is kind of forefront in my mind is how do we bring about really big changes um, without generating enormous amounts of pushback that then will reverse those and you know perhaps take us further back in the other direction. Um, my neighbors are doing construction. I'm just going to close the door. <laughs> One moment, please. But also have children who may run in, so apologies for the disruptions. Um, look, so it's possible to make really big splash with stuff like statues, right? You can have, <laughs> literally in Bristol, we had a very big splash one year ago. Um, it's fantastic for getting you a platform, right? It's just phenomenal how much attention this topic draws. And the function in my mind of these debates is to create a platform where you then have the possibility to bring about really big structural change. Um, so I've, I've often said that I think the theory behind these movements is if you give the statues a shake, then the structures will wobble and there's a moment where there's a possibility of big change and that depends on follow through and that requires us to be just as visionary about what that follow through looks like, just as visionary about what the society is that we're trying to work towards as we are about the kind of more proximate stuff about statues that's, you know, kind of in some ways a lot easier to aim at. Um, there's, so, so I think there's a moment here that all of that attention has been generated and there's a moment here where we can make really big positive change. As we all know, it's also a moment where we've had lots and lots of pushback, um, not just pushback, we've had really significant pieces of legislation that are coming through that are in direct response to these movements and that are designed to try to stabilize things. Um, so what do we do about that? I have shifted views to some extent from when I started out in this in this area. I worked, I worked with Countering Colston uh, in Bristol for from 2015 to 2016 or you know, like around then up to 2020. 
um, was very involved in that campaign. And um, I started out thinking it was just completely obvious as an issue. I just could not imagine how anybody would be kind of in favor of keeping the name Colston Hall and not be a raving racist. I just couldn't understand how that was possible. Um, but I, I ended up sort of talking a lot with people on different sides of the issue and um, kind of committed myself to really listening to views on different sides and trying to understand the different worldviews in, in place and to understand them charitably and to understand them in a way that humanizes every perspective. Um, and so in, increasingly I sort of moved into kind of like trying trying to understand these different views and then helping institutions understand them. So speaking a lot with um, the people leading Colston Hall at the time became the Bristol Beacon, speaking with people at the cathedral, um, people in the government. So there, were, there was a lot of like kind of communicating with institutional leaders. Um, and I guess I, 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 moved, I moved from quite a rigid kind of strident type of position to one that's a lot gentler, um, and 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 partly that's pragmatic. So partly it's about thinking about what will actually bring about this kind of long term change. Um, I I've been I've been quite influenced by Buddhist thought, and in within Buddhist ethics, there's a one of the precepts that you undertake if you're so, sort of becoming serious about Buddhism is that you undertake a uh, an item of training consisting in abstaining from harsh speech. And I think that's really interesting. And I've thought quite a lot about why, why is there this precept? Why is, it, why is there kind of a precept against harsh speech? And I think the background thought there is that harsh speech tends to generate more harsh speech, just as violence tends to generate violence. Um, and I've become very interested in how is it possible to bring about radical social change uh, with gentleness? Is that possible? And, and I've come more and more to believe that it is. And it's an interesting question with something like um, these statues. How do you take them down with a level of gentleness that will enable other people to absorb the message and come along with you? Um, and some of this has been in my thought over the past. So over the past year, um, I've been sitting on the Bristol History Commission, which was set up by the mayor of Bristol after the fall of the Colston statue to try to help the city uh, understand its past so as to better shape where it's going to go. Uh, that tiny little remit was quite daunting for several months. I didn't know what we were going to do about it. Um, anyway, in this role, I've, I, I did quite a bit of work on looking at how to curate the Colston statue exhibit. So the one that has just opened at the M Shed in Bristol. Um, I, we, it was an amazing process, right? Because you have this, with my kind of thoughts about harsh speech in mind, you're, you're, you can't avoid a form of harsh speech if you're placing a highly vandalized statue into a space like that when you know that a lot of people in Bristol saw Colston as um, a symbol of kindness and philanthropy of course it's mistaken right but there's there's uh, there are like innocent parts of people's identities that get caught in the crossfire there um, so how do you how do you create a level of gentleness around that that will help people to be able to absorb it um, we ended up uh, using a very brilliant blue as the kind of thematic color as a symbol of clarity. Um, and around the statue itself, there's a sort of neutrality to the space. I wrote a set of dialogues that are being projected above the statue. Uh, so they, they present different sides. You know, you hear from one person, you hear from another person, back to the first person, and then a rhetorical question that hands things back over to the viewer, um, the, the participant. Um, I think that's been very effective as a kind of softening tool. But I, th I think there's there's a real question here. If we don't find a way to create gentleness around this, then I, then we will get deeper entrenchment coming back the other direction. Um, I also, I guess a couple of other lessons. One is that I think institutional com change comes through a mixture of internal lobbying and external pressure. So it, there's a there's a lot of laborious internal lobbying in these institutions where you're getting nowhere and it's just it can feel like you're just being gaslighted all the time and there's this there are these blocks right um and then you know a media story comes out and all of a sudden all of that work you've done pays off and there's a big shift <laughs> um so that mixture of internal pressure and external 
pressure, I think is a really powerful one. Um, and it doesn't, I, I'm using the word pressure there, but again, actually it doesn't necessarily have to be pressure. It can be internal preparation, shall we say. Um, yeah, I guess I, I, maybe I'll just close by saying that um, I think we, yeah, I think I think we'll get so much further if we're very visionary about the positive big social change that we want to bring about. And if we're articulating that positive vision um, and the the there's there's just a really key thing there of having that kind of a positive focus that we're giving people to folk to sort of move towards. Um, and I guess in the in the Bristol History Commission, we're just about to launch a piece of work that I hope uh, lots of people will get interested in. Please check it out. Please get involved yourself. Um, it's called Bridging Histories, and it's going to be a learning project that's open for anybody to do. Um, it's very gentle, so I guess it shows you something. There's a little bit of there's a little bit of space for looking at monuments right in the middle, um, but there's a lot of other stuff that's just about people connecting to each other, sharing their stories, having their having kind of affirming the positive, distinct identities of every different corner of the society, creating space for that to happen. Um, that I think maybe we'll create a kind of nurturing ground in which um, in which change might become quite easy. So let's see. Okay, uh, thanks, Joanna, um, particularly for bringing in the role of institutions. Um, and uh, I, I will look forward to hearing more about the role that you occupy within institutions as well as without um, and the processes that you've seen unfold um, in that role. Um, okay, uh, Alistair, over to you. Hi there. Um, Megan, firstly, thank you to you um, for the invitation um, it's, uh, and the opportunity to be involved in this discussion. It's um, quite, uh, um, I'm perhaps the least scholarly member in this panel at the moment, so uh, hopefully I can contribute something positively at least. Um, so I'm going to start by going back to those events in Bristol a year ago and where my wife Jen and myself attended the march on the 7th of June. Um, to protest, um, you know, in solidarity with protesters in the US seeking justice for the murder of George Floyd at the hands of um, Chauvin, um, an on-duty police officer. We had no idea at the time where the events of that day would lead us um, or the roles that we play in them. But I look back now and recollect what I think as a wonderful sequence of moments where we found ourselves in the right place at the right time to cause a little trouble and to borrow the words of late John Lewis, good trouble, necessary trouble. Sadly, we weren't there to actually witness the toppling of Colston statue. We were in between where the statue stood in the center and Castle Park, the destination for the march. Um, but when we received social media footage from a friend of ours, we had to dash back there and see what we could of this historic event. Um, Jen immediately ran off to go and find the statue amongst the crowd while I tried to locate a friend of mine. And then after I found him and was in conversation, I looked around and discovered that the statue was on the ground right beside me. And there were a group of people pushing and rolling it. And I'll never forget the hollow metallic clunking sound it made. It was something like from Clash of the Titans where the Colossus of Rhodes comes to life. It was an incredible moment. Um, I remember thinking that it, Everybody looked like they were struggling, pushing it along the ground. And my instincts just took over and I found myself jumped on and pushing, rolling it alongside them. I soon realized how heavy and awkward an object this statue was while it was on the ground. And, and the process just, just needed a little direction. Um, Without the, the weight of the base on it attached to it any longer, then it became a little top heavy and the shape and the kind of dynamics of it meant that it was clunking around in a kind of like a clock hand. So it was a very stop start process and it just had to keep being adjusted to change the course. Um, working in the building trades myself day to day, I guess you can say that my inner foreman surfaced at that point. And I pulled the proceedings to a stop and just asked people to unwind the rope around its base and part. And I was past this uh, the end of the rope, which I tied up around its neck and formed this great big handle. And um, at that point, um, there'd been a little lull in the noise and the atmosphere in the crowd. 
And as soon as we took off dragging it along the road, obviously there was a surge in excitement, surge in movement and a surge in power at that. It was an electric atmosphere and something I, I, I've never experienced anything like. <coughs> um, so at that point, while we were dragging it, it just started flying and the noise of it being dragged along the crowd, along the concrete and tarmac, it was just in, an incredible moment in time that, that it was an indeterminate amount of time that it took. I couldn't tell you exactly how long the process took, but I can recall my thought processes while it was happening. And I remember thinking about how significant it was that this had happened. I remember thinking about the reasons why we were there to protest in the first place that day. And I was aware that there had been a few petitions in the city for the calling for the removal of the statue over a number of years. So in 2015, Joanna was saying, um, all of which I had failed. And I felt it was important to make sure that this action was followed through and ran its course. My wife had educated me quite a bit about who the man was that this statue depicted. And I knew that it had caused offence to many people in my life all of which made me just more determined to see it through. After it eventually reached the water and we'd thrown it in, there was a TV camera crew nearby looking for people to talk to. I didn't hesitate in standing up and saying who I was, what I did and why I did it. Because for me, it was also really important to take ownership of those actions because without that, it opened the door to critics to call it wanton vandalism for running. A short while after that, Jen and I returned to the now vacant plinth as she really wanted to revisit that place anyway and wanted to climb on top of the plinth. When she approached it and realised the scale of it and how tall it was, it was a little bit daunting to say the least. She was having second thoughts. Um, she was struggling and I remember urging her up and saying, you can do it, you can and even encouraged her to stand up on my shoulders and use me to climb up there. As soon as she belly flopped up onto it, I just dashed back about 20 metres and pulled my phone out of the pocket, pointed it and shoot. It was like, I didn't get a second thought to composition or anything. Um, it was just, you know, in the heat of the moment, things are happening a lot quicker than in reality. So I pointed, shot a couple of snaps, ran back down to the plinth and held it down. And that was that. Um, and then afterwards, when we were walking away, we pulled out the phone, looked at the photos, and we were both struck by how powerful that image was. It's, it was breathtaking, mainly because it was kind of silhouetted, uh, I think, because of the lighting, it helped that. Um, but so, we just had the thought that we need to use this in a really positive way to help increase awareness about the events of this day and also of, of the themes behind it, the reason why people are protesting and the issue of race. So without putting to a, a name to it, the concept of what is now the Bristol 18 was born at that point. Um, it's now quite well known, I guess, what happened next. You know, I posted one of these photos online uh, with the words, my wife, my life, she matters. And by lunchtime the next day, Mark Quinn had contacted me. And five weeks later, the statue of Jen Reed, my wife, was installed on the same plane previously occupied by the likeness of this slave trader. And in her own words, the plinth had been cleansed. Since then, we've both been involved in some incredible projects, but my primary focus outside of my working life has been developing creative projects to support the anti-racism cause. And a few days after the June 7th protest, local media reported the police were looking for 18 individuals in relation to the toppling, and that's where the name came from. So the first, um, I'll, I'll just share my screen at this point, if I can, just to show everybody a photo they've probably already seen. Where, oh, sorry, cancel that. Share contents. Bear with me two seconds. We can go back and, oh dear. No, I can't see it, I'm sorry, I'm gonna. Do you have the share screen button on your screen? Yeah, I do, okay. it's not, um, 
Yeah, because it's just not getting given me the option to. Oh. Sorry, I'm working off an iPad, so that's probably where it's going wrong. Um, but anyway, I can work around that. That's fine. So um, the first slide was going to be the photo that I took. So you're probably all quite familiar with that. Um, second image was going to be um, a poster image, which we uh, we collaborated with a local artist called Victoria Topping, based in Bath. Um, she paints uh, and and uses digital imagery to create really strikingly beautiful, positive images. Um, the poster's actually up behind me. I can probably lean the screen there. There we go. So we called that one Bristol Rising. It was just um, the message we were trying to put forward was just one of positivity and um, taking uh, taking it forward in, in, in a kind of ed educational light. <clears throat> Excuse me. So so that led us to um, our own T-shirt project, which we called Love and Learn. And that was a commemorative T-shirt based uh, with the date and time and everything of, of the toppling. Um, the image of Jen up on the plinth. Um, and it was something quite dynamic. We just wanted to keep using this and punch this image out to really keep the protest in people's minds. You know, um, at that point, the statue of her wasn't in the public realm at all. Um, this is something, a protest that could, could have gone very differently if the police had intervened at the time. Um, so for me, it's all about keeping profile on the cause. So <clears throat> from there, we've, um, I, in come September, a couple of months after her statue had gone up, I really wanted to find a wall to create a mural uh, of her and put that out there with a similar sort of unified approach to taking on the future um, and how we can do that collectively together is going to be the most difficult bridge to cross I think um, getting enough people on board so by putting that out there with with a really positive message um, and we were given some words by a local poet Lawrence who and which were Bristol rise up stand tall Bristol is a city for all um, so we took control of that narrative from the off um, because I think that's really important as well. When you're talking about putting artwork in public spaces, you can raise questions, but you can't can not control the narrative to a degree. I think you have to talk about unity and positivity, um, but how do you get the message across without causing abrasion and friction and confrontation? So that is where I'm now focused outside of um, outside of my working life. My priority is all about the Bristol 18 and activating public spaces to raise questions on social justice, on social issues, full stop. Um, and we're going to expand this not just around race. You know, there are a lot of on-ground social issues in the world, which I don't think get enough coverage. So um, that for me is where art belongs, asking questions of people and engaging the public to encourage uh, some kind of interaction. Okay. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the role of public art in general, um, the multiple roles that it can play, um, as well as what happens after a statue comes down. Uh, so finally, uh, Gary, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Megan, and um, yeah, welcome and thank you everyone for your contributions. I want to start with the title of um, the session because in a way, I think it highlights the challenge we have. It's remembering empire, contesting statues. Well, if you don't remember empire, it's really difficult to understand why we're contesting statues. Now, um, and we have this challenge, right, this kind of um, burden, really. It happens every October in Britain, every February in America, uh, when it's Black History Month. And Black people are often uh, given the task of explaining not just their history, but everybody's history. Because... Um, you know, how does Britain make sense without colonialism when it doesn't, you know? 
you know, so much of Black History Month told in the passive voice, Rosa Parks was kicked off a bus, people were enslaved, and then we have to bring it all together in one month um, uh, and kind of uh, and explain to people, and in Britain in particular, um, it's a very willful, very selective kind of forgetfulness. Um, people will talk about the great and great Britain. People will talk about two world wars and one world cup that the sun never set on the British empire. People will evoke, there's no kind of real self interrogation as to how the hell did we get a seat on the UN security council or permanent seat, this small island, right? That, that there's, um, there's a history to that. And, uh, and so there's this, very and we heard it um in the uh, um quoting of uh, will hutton is just the misunderstanding of what had actually happened i had a colleague once and i um it's something and i said well you know there was colonialism and he said yeah but that was a long time ago and i said you know it was going on while you were a child and it has been going on since the and since the holocaust and he was like no i didn't know that and he really didn't know that and so <laughs> so then we come for these statues and there's a significant section of the population who are like what what are you doing why why would you do that and it's like they've entered the middle of a movie somebody's got stabbed and they're like, well, why the hell did that happen? And they weren't there for the beginning of the movie, but we were, we were like, <laughs> we were not just the extras, but the kind of like central, like central protagonists in the, at the beginning of this movie. So then we have to explain the rest of the movie to them. And if you've ever been to a movie with someone who's hard of hearing or a child or whatever, where you have to stop what you're doing and say, listen, this is what's been going on while you weren't paying attention, while you're in the bathroom or just, you know, chomping on popcorn. That, and so we have these symbols but people don't understand what they symbolize. And that makes it a real challenge. And when I say they don't understand, that's not quite true. They do have a sense, it's a, it's a latent sense. And it's kind of, like I said, there's a, a range of things that British people will say about themselves, but then they won't follow through quite often with the logic. Well, how did that happen? Who put the great in Great Britain? who, you know, who was made small as a result of that greatness and so on and so forth. And this isn't new. 60% uh, of people in the government survey in 1951, British people couldn't name a single colony. My guess is that most of them said India, <laughs> but it wasn't a colony by that stage. And so then they were like, no, you got me. You know, if you go to Andrew Levy's book where Gilbert says, you know, how you, you put me anywhere, I could tell you where Britain was, where Liverpool was, where London was, how did they not know me? And here we are, for want of a better term, Gilbert's children and, or grandchildren really. And, um, and, and, and here are these symbols which offend uh, and I'm going to be honest, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't have wanted to start this conversation at statues. That wouldn't have been my, you know, but you know, <laughs> you don't choose the terrain um, on which you fight. And I worried at the beginning in Britain with Black Lives Matter that it was going to get, it was going to stop there. Because if you ask most Black people, What's the biggest issue for you right now? They're not going to say statues. So education, jobs, health, whatever it is, which doesn't mean the statues aren't a problem, which doesn't mean that they shouldn't come down. But I, I, I had a worry at the beginning that all the energy was going to be sucked up in this thing, which given the poor state of education of British people about their own history, which we will be fighting an uphill struggle to kind of um, uh, uh, to, to win. Now that didn't happen 
I think, but there was a risk of it happening. But uh, <laughs> the reason that these, the reason that we're having this conversation and the reason that um, Oreo College went backwards and forwards, it wasn't a power of our argument. Our argument has been the same all the way through. And one of the things we learned in our code studies that most of these statues, they've been contested for the last 50 years. Like the, the statue in Martinique that they, uh, of uh, Josephine that they took down. She'd been beheaded 20 years ago. I mean, it was a headless statue. These are not kind of new. They'd taken down Nelson in Barbados, where my parents are from. There was a Calypso song about take down Nelson back in the early 70s. These things are not new. What's new is that last year, and this speaks to the whole <laughs> conference really, there was a mass movement. And that mass movement made it more embarrassing to admit that you were going to keep Rhodes up than to take him down. That there was, it wasn't like they just had a come to Jesus moment. I thought, oh God, you, you know what? I've been reading through some of the things Rhodes did and he was a bit off. They knew what he did, but it, it became untenable for that moment. And then to some extent, and this is some of the weaknesses in the Black Lives Matter kind of ecology, that kind of it's fast break politics, it comes together, it goes away, unlike Roads Must Fall, which is there the whole time. When they felt that pressure kind of subside, then they take the brakes off. I don't think they are that smart, actually, because I think that what they're doing is, is keeping a running saw there that will be a focus for them. And as is the case with all of these things, we're never just talking about the statue, right? Oxford University has an appalling history of kind of attracting, educating, um, uh, passing black students. And so the statue is related to something else. And so it remains, it remains in the public eye, it remains a focus of militancy, and they look like the kind of double crossing, kind of um, untrustworthy gits that they are, don't they? They look bad and not just bad. I mean, if keeping Rhodes' statue up is essential to a notion of Britishness, so is keeping your word apparently. And so these, um, these moments are, are actually very important when uh, uh, we test them, but I do think that Taking Joanna's point about there are people inside and there are people outside. This would this was one of those cases where it's the people outside who made it happen. The people inside were there to kind of, put, but if the people outside hadn't been there, then they would be tying us up in commissions and uh, talking groups and and uh, all the rest of it for uh, as long as they could. Now I I think that what we see here is a very fragile historical culture. Uh, not exclusive to Britain, but I think general to Europe, where the most egregious bits of our anti-Black racism took place somewhere else, uh, while our sense of enlightenment, renaissance, this and that, yada, yada, happened here, and people um, don't know how to understand that. We saw that when the American GIs came to Britain and Britain first of all asked America not to bring the black GIs because they said we can't cope with your color bars. Uh, even as Britain was operating color bars all around the rest of the world, the idea of having a color bar in Britain was just too offensive. And an awful lot of that played out actually in, uh, in Bristol with local people, uh, particularly young women fraternizing with um, uh, the GIs and this, um, becoming a problem. I th here I think is our challenge and, and um, the piece I did that was in the Guardian, kind of um, uh, the flaw is, is, uh, is also in the piece really, which is that a, we, we are understood to be talking about decolonizing. So deing something, kind of taking something out, so taking, extracting something, taking down 
statues, um, um, turning around, taking down, uh, decolonize, decolonizing. And there are some people who freak out and who think like, well, what, what are you putting up? What is your vision for what? Now I know that decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing universities doesn't just mean taking things out. But if that's all that people hear, we want to take down the statues, decolonize the curriculum, stop all your racism, then it's, so there has to be within this, and there is, but we don't foreground it, a kind of positive notion of what, well, what, what do we want? What kind of society do we want to build? And it doesn't have to be that every single plinth that we take down, we have to have a plan for. But we have to have a plan for uh, a notion of the public art we would like, of the curriculum we would like, not just the one that uh, we don't like. Because what it taps is a very, I don't think it's just a white establishment, it's a latent identity. Most of these statues, I think, most people couldn't even name the statue, don't even know anything about the statue until you say, we're gonna take it down. And then they're like, why are you gonna take down my statue? That's my history, that's my past. They had no interest in it before, quite often. And um, not uh, obviously not everyone, but a large number of people, as evidenced by skinheads, Zeke Heiling outside Churchill. Obviously, they don't know what Churchill did, because if they did, be less with the Zeke Heiling. So it speaks to a very latent identity, which is interestingly, given that we're supposed to be the snowflakes, that they are triggered, and the loss isn't just the loss of a statue, it's the loss of manufacturing, the loss of an industrial base, the loss of a kind of a, of, of a past. Um, and um, and that's, our, that's our challenge, and it's a significant challenge, that kind of, when we contest these statu statues, we, we are contesting a history that is not widely known is not sufficiently known. And to the extent to which it is known, it's distorted and um, kind of refracted through its own self-interest and comes out as heritage or, or whatever. Whereas actually most of the people that we're talking about were awful to white people too, actually. They were just kind of generally pretty awful people. So um, um, I don't think we, I, I don't think we advance by saying my history is better than yours, not least when we're dealing with a lot of people who don't know their history. And so to kind of echo uh, Inas's point, really, it's bigger. And unless we understand it always as being bigger uh, uh, in terms of everything, jobs and race and um, uh, uh, you know employment, education, all of those things and build some vision of what we want then there runs the risk of people who might be up for that vision just thinking all i can hear is you want to get rid of stuff uh which is not all we want to do but um sometimes that can be mostly what we talk about and the, the way and the way that we get there with a large number of people to kind of emphasize this point right in the end we got here because there was a mass movement that came from outside that forced the conversation that made them take down a lot of stuff that made Oriole say we'll take him down even they didn't want to that made them wait until they thought it had subsided until uh they could uh change their mind so it's it's mass pressure that makes them do this we're not going to debate our way out of this thanks gary and thank you to all of the presenters. Um, before we open it up for Q&A, um, I'd like to give everyone a chance to respond to each other. Um, certainly there are a lot of common threads, um, maybe some, uh, some uh, disagreements as well, um, or um, you know, opportunities to, uh, to engage critically with one another. Um, but uh, why don't we go in the same order as we did uh, before? Um, and uh, I suppose if you don't have any comments for any of the other panelists, that's fine too, but I imagine that you do um, things to, to say to each other. Um, so Simokai, um, would you like to respond to, uh, to what the other speakers have said? Um, great, so I, I'll 
keep it relatively brief, I think, just at, at this juncture, but um, I guess a couple of things. Um, so one was on this point about pressure and lobbying and kind of external pressure and internal lobbying. I think, so I'm the only person, uh, actually no, I'm one of only two people who was um, involved with Rhodes Must Fall at the beginning and is still in Oxford University. And I think one of the things that has unfolded um, is there has been change, but very kind of hidden or tucked away or a bit slow. Um, and before last, last year's Freedom Summer, um, my kind of, I guess my disposition was to think, okay, Rhodes Must Fall had not uh, achieved its kind of headline act, but there were these debates going on about curriculum. And I think a lot of them happening in quite a serious way. Now the university is this um, incredibly complicated, uh, decentralized uh, federalist institution made up of a myriad of self-governing institutions. So you lose the sense of collective um, but at that disseminated level, there are kind of granular moments of change. And I think that's important to hold on to, particularly in light of um, what, you know, Inas and Gary have said about these things needing to be bigger, because one might, as a student, not see that there is a bigger picture and that there has been an impact. And this is not entirely a total kind of reversion to the status quo. Uh, and that's a thought I try to keep in my head. And I am aware now that faculty are going to be putting pressure on Oriel College about the statue. So I think the kind of norms about that conversation, so things are coming up, there's a boycott plan, there's all sorts of activity planned. So I think some of the norms are changing. Um, I guess I briefly wanted to, yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe briefly just on the kind of both articulating a bigger vision, but also thinking about um, listening to people um, with a bit more empathy and trying to inhabit the world view of those who feel that their identities are under attack. Um, and something I've thought a lot about, and I don't really have a neat resolution to it. My sense was with the roads must fall, certainly at the beginning and to some extent now, it very much felt like we were under attack. So I mean, the way it became inflamed. So right at the beginning of Rhodes was Fall, the idea of decolonizing the curriculum, the idea of diversifying the institution were seen as really kind of positive things to be doing. Like it makes sense that for a global cosmopolitan kind of culturally innovative sort of institution should be thinking along those lines. That was kind of how we tried to pitch it. And then to be called kind of ISIS and iconoclasts and so on kind of triggered this um, like unraveling spiral. And then there were, it was just laced with all of these racialized tropes of students being baying mobs and of being petulant and so on. And so trying to have these good faith arguments was really tough. And I think um, as best I can, I'd like to see that shift to a kind of creative tension with the institution perhaps, but it is really hard when you're kind of on the inside and you feel like you're getting slammed the whole time. Um, and like, I'm one of maybe seven black professors and it's just a really exhausting kind of position to be. And I think that the extat norms don't, don't lend themselves to that. So I'm kind of keen to push that conversation and think, well, what do we do within the kind of institutions and, and setups that we already have, particularly given their kind of uh, demographic makeup? Okay, um, I'll leave it there for now. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mukai. Um, so uh, Ines, um, would you like to respond to uh, any comments by the other panelists? Sure. Yes, I'll keep my reflection quite short. It's mainly um, towards Gary's uh, piece, which really resonated with me. And, you know, it's also quite, I think, disheartening in a way that we still have to say explicitly that this is not about statues. It's not about taking one statue down and replacing it with another or kind of you know, taking it down and then the problem is resolved. It's, the, it's what comes behind that, it's what it represents, it's why it's up there, it's why there's so much resistance to take it down. And you know, I think your point about people understanding their own history is a really, really key point. Like even as, so I, I was educated here and I think just in general, even my white counterparts still don't know 
their own history. And so, and so, and I, I saw that while I knew my own history wasn't being represented and the history of the country that I was uh, living in wasn't being represented. And I think, you know, that's something that is very essential to tackle uh, in education and also as a culture as well. And that does link to identity because if you know where you come from, you also are more grounded and can, and you can kind of navigate these different challenges. And so, you know, that's, that's what the problem with statues is that taking them down represents a threat to those that really kind of link to it. So I, my point was that we, this also has a very strong educational kind of spin to it, which is also quite fitting for Rizmo School since it takes place in an educational setting. Um, and that's something that, yeah, definitely needs to be addressed Thanks, Ines. And I'm, I'm noticing from the questions that are coming in now that this, uh, the role of educational institutions seems to be um, a key theme, I think, for the discussion. Um, it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, so, Joanna, um, would you like to respond to the other panelists? Um, yes, I, I likewise loved the point about um, people not knowing, uh, not knowing our own history. I mean, I think the, I think the extent to which people imagine that other, others share a similar, broadly similar set of facts you know, we just massively overestimate that, massively, massively overestimate that, which is where I think the power of um, personal stories and personal stories that tap into history is, you know, just a very, very powerful thing. I suppose since the, since the theme of this is really around activism and being effective activists, I, I'll just make a couple of observations about that I think are kind of lessons from the countering Colston side um, that haven't come in, in, the, in up in the rest of the conversation and maybe worth pointing out. So yes, mass movements can be incredibly powerful, but it's quite interesting. I think in Bristol's case, um, it was a tiny little group in the countering, the countering Colston campaign was very, very effective in creating a huge amount of attention. But it was a little group of about seven people who are uh, the main organizers of that. Um, there were just a few tiny little sort of um, demonstrations outside of venues with chalking on the on the floor. What really, really worked, the reason that it was very effective is um, a mixture of very, very deep local knowledge. So the campaigners were, it, was, it wasn't actually a student group. It was mostly older, um, mostly working class uh, Bristolians who really, really knew the, the landscape of social meanings in this local area. And that was very, very important. Um, it was a small group of people with voices amplified by journalism. So you don't need very many people to be doing stuff if journalists are interested and are gonna be writing about what you're doing. Um, so when you're thinking about how to organize, you know, getting a, getting a logo and a website and then really, really working with local media is very, very powerful. And most national, national news stories start out as local news stories. So getting to know the local media and really making some of those links is, is really, really important and very powerful way to do things. Um, I would say on the working within institutions or in any way working with institutions, bureauc their bureaucracies. So coming back to this point, they're not monoliths. It's not the case that University of Bristol just decided to do a thing like, you know, maybe yes, at some policy level eventually, but it is individuals. And if you, you're gonna run up against blocking figures and then you'll find somebody who is an ally and is gonna help make things happen. So uh, not thinking, oh, I've spoken with one person from this institution, therefore that's it. Yeah. Um, it just be aware of the diversity of views and the importance of seeking different different uh, perspectives within those. Um, and yes, I think we haven't talked at all about democratic legitimacy. And I think it's a really, really important thing for us to be thinking about in these movements. Um, how do we pursue radical change in society when people aren't ready for it in some ways, right? And how do you do that in a way that's democratic? How do you do that in a way that is non-coercive and that is um, gonna draw people and attract them along. I think it's very possible, um, but it's really important for us to think about very carefully. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about models for decision-making 
that could be could have a, achieve a level of de democratic legitimacy on these things. So the idea of citizen panels, for instance, is quite interesting. So what if it was the case that we had a citizen panel that um, is random, you know, random representative group assembled in the same way that a jury would be assembled, uh, that then hears different, you know, arguments on different sides, um, has the capacity to either recommend or make a decision what would what would a kind of what are some of the other models that people could be playing with? Um, so just some things for for people to think about. Yeah, yeah thanks, Joanna. Um, I'm glad you you mentioned the uh, the role of citizens panels um, or the role of citizens at large. I think, and I think that links to Inas's comments earlier about growing up in Oxford versus attending the university as a student. Um, so maybe we'll come back uh, to that later in the discussion. Uh, Alice, there, would you like to res respond to uh, to anyone's remarks? Yeah, I'd just, um, I'd just say that it's history in its nature is a difficult thing to pinpoint. Um, it, you know, I don't know what the, what the dictionary term, definition of that term is, but for me, it's, you know, you ask questions about when does it start? When does something become a piece of history? The truth is that like, actions today will become history for tomorrow, you know? So when you think, when, when you look at, you know, the argument about uh, erasing history, that's that's something that you have to, we've always stood up for saying, this is really not the point, you're missing the point. And that's what the danger where the focal, the focus is taken by statues in this instance over the past 12 months. And I get that, you know, I 100% get that, but that's why we're motivated now to, to invest in, in education that isn't being catered for within the system, within the organizations that are providing it. So with all of our, our artistic projects that we're involved in, we are pushing to raise funds to invest in these organizations that are providing that education outside of the curriculum. Obviously, we all know that the curriculum is what needs to change. You know, I call it miseducation. I was a product of that system myself. And I felt that I was never given the correct information for many, many years until I went and found that for myself. I, I recall traveling around, traveling to Egypt when I was in my early 20s and observing firsthand the locals' um, opinion of me as a, Briti a white British guy, you know, just turning up. But right there, you can see the relics of colonialism all over the world, wherever you go. And you can't run away from that. So if people aren't going to open their eyes and take that on for themselves, then that education has to be put out there in some format. And if the truth isn't being told in the full syllabus, in the full curriculum to put that contextualization in, in on these objects that are still these relics that are still part of the public realm, then you can't really, you know, it's always going to be a difficult fight. I think the key thing is contextualizing them correctly in the first place. Um, how that educating process is managed and, and put forth, that it's, it's never going to be an easy question to answer, obviously. But I feel that we can start to raise those questions in the public forum by, by putting pieces of art out there into spaces that they can't walk past and ignore. Great, thanks, Alistair. Um, Gary, uh, do you have any uh, comments for two the, very the quick, panelists? Two very quick points, and they're, they're both um, responses to Joanna, really. When I talk about mass movement, I'm talking about George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. I know that there were people, you know, and, and it's often the case, small groups of people who are keeping the torch burning for a significant amount of time. I don't think we would be having this conversation were it not for Black Lives Matter and the pollination of that. and that, was that mass movement that kind of knocked down statues all you know all, all over the world and Bristol was the kind of most uh, 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 graphic one and actually my concern in terms of Black Lives Matter is the degree to which those small pockets of people who incubate these struggles over periods of time kind of the, I don't know how much it produced that as opposed to these mass gatherings and the dissipations. The other is that kind of democratic legitimacy is important. And particularly when we're talking about what to do with these spaces is important. 
my personal feeling is it's not always necessary and it's not always possible, particularly if you're talking, if you're a minority, that um, uh, the citizens of Montgomery would never have voted to desegregate the buses. And they were made to. And they were made to by a uh, mass movement. The kind of, so even if black people could have voted in Montgomery, they wouldn't have been able to, there wouldn't have been enough allies, but it had to stop. So sometimes there is a, a, a moral legitimacy. Now, obviously we have to be really careful with how we evoke that because everybody's got their own morality. And, um, um, you know, there's a, there's a limit to what, there's a limit to how often you want to pull that lever, but that kind of, um, uh, but when those democratic processes break down, when they don't produce, when they can't produce, or when they, you know, lie, <laughs> like at Oriel College, where they say they're going to do it and they said they're not going to do it, well then actually I think that there is a strong case outside of voting for just kind of pulling the thing down. Um, and, you know, that should be a thing of last resort because the absence of those statues is also a sore for for um, uh, uh, for some people. So it's kind of, you know, you want to be careful what you wish for. But anyway. Okay, thanks, Gary. Uh, and thank you, everyone, um, for your uh, for starting the discussion, really, um, for, uh, for sharing your thoughts with one another. We have quite a few questions now in the Q&A and in the chat. Please continue to, to add them. Um, We'll get through as many as we can um, in the next uh, 33 minutes. Um, but uh, as uh, Josh Platsky just said in the chat, it's a pity that this is the closing panel because it's it's linking to discussions that have happened earlier in the conference, certainly uh, discussions that are ongoing amongst social movements themselves. Um, and uh, those conversations will continue you know, after this panel ends and after the conference ends. Um, but uh, so with that in mind, um, one of the uh, one of the themes that's emerging in the questions that have been posed is around the role of educational institutions. Um, so Amani Loi, for example, um, asks about um, the role of educational curricula um, and uh, the importance of rethinking um, the uh, the history curriculum um, at the level of schools, primary and secondary schools, um, and uh, asks she asks. Um, what the best way forward is from the top in that respect. Similarly, um, uh, a, I think this is AJ um, Eliezer Isles um, comments that we need to replace British island history um, with British imperial history um, to really understand um, British history um, at large. Uh, and there was another question, pardon me, um, yeah, so oh, from Peter Cox um, about the hierarchical structure of educational institutions, um, the possibilities for transforming educational curricula within um, uh, hierarchical and um, often exclusionary, virtually always exclusionary um, educational institutions. Um, so that's, that's more of a, an exploration of themes than a question, but I wonder whether the panelists could comment on the role of educational curricula um, and of the institutions that teach them. Um, in uh, remembering higher contestant statues. Um, let's see, so why don't we mix up the order uh, this time. Uh, Ines, would you like to go first? So in my opinion, I think the entire educational system needs a rehaul. I don't think it's really a case of, you know, introducing uh, another class or a course or new content or different content. I think the way also that we are taught to understand things and learn is problematic. And I like Joanna's point about stories um, from, you know, talking from experiences. And this is another form of education rather than having kind of textbooks from, uh, you know, particular recount of what happened in South Africa, because the problem is every kind of recount is a story told from a particular perspective. And so uh, you don't necessarily resolve the issue by just changing the, you know, a particular narrative to another, but I think it's actually giving space for multiple narratives 
listening to different kinds of uh, histories. And I think that is quite, that is quite uh, important to take into account. And that's of course very difficult. And part of that means having people at the top who are made up of very diverse kind of uh, backgrounds. And so that's also another side that's not necessarily kind of visible, but is very, very important. Those who are making decisions of what education looks like for younger people needs to be made up of those who represent the students. And at the moment, that's not the case at all. Thanks, Inas. Uh, Joanna, unfortunately, has had to, uh, to leave. Um, been, uh, very helpful to have her um, here. Um, but uh, let's see, Alistair, would you like to come in um, on this question of the role of education and educational institutions? And perhaps you might comment on, the, um, uh, on education outside of um, institutions as well. Um, I think the first point um, when you look at education, um, and for me, this is about essentially history, education of history, because that's what places us within culture, within societies. Um, our world, however small it might be, um, wherever you live, is increasingly multicultural, it's multinational. And without awareness of the people that you live alongside, then there's, there's no really good tale to come from that. I can't see it. So it, primarily in this country, it worries me that history is an optional subject that you can be avoided at such a young age. That, you know, with, with that being the case and people opting out, there's no, there's no recourse from that point. You know, they're basing their historic knowledge on so few facts. You know, there's nothing to place context on that in where they develop into an adult, actually start asking the real questions about culture and where they fit into their own society. So that's, that's something that needs to certainly be dealt with. Um, outside of curriculum, um, I mean, I'm, I'm massively impressed by uh, a local organization, um, Cargo Movement, um, that stands for Charting African Resilience and Giving Opportunities. And they are using a number of media means to develop ways to bring that education, um, bringing, bringing um, stories for, that haven't been told in this country in amongst the general population into people and giving it a forum. And, and I think that's essential work. They're, they're also, they've also just this week launched, um, I see on Monday on the anniversary of Cost of Falling, launched the People's Platform, which is an augmented reality interactive format, um, a way of engaging with that plinth that is still vacant. I think it should remain vacant, to be honest, it's, it's a focal point for now because it's sort of its emptiness, it can become a place where things can be said that weren't able to previously, um, almost a speaker's corner, if you like, or a, or a, a kind of a routinely, um, um, you know, routine kind of variation of people's um, impressions of what should belong there. And that's what this interactive media version does. Um, it gives people's creations um, a reality without being something permanent. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, Gary, would you like to respond to this question about educational curricula and institutions? So I've, um, I've spoken too much already, so uh, no. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Simokai, how about you? Well, I was actually going to, to defer partly because my role in education is primarily spent uh, teaching a very, very small group of postgraduate students in a really research intense environment. And I think this is really about the broader landscape of, it, of education. So I'll, I'll hold back. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, so a second theme that's emerging in the questions um, is about statues themselves, the material objects. Um, uh, what happens to them once they fall? Um, where should they be displayed? How should they be displayed? And really uh, linking to that, um, what should the purpose of statues be? Um, there's a comment from 
um, I'm just scroll through this, from Lawrence, um, saying that there are those of us who use these statues to teach people um, and uh, that they could be, you know, pedagogical tools. So how, 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 if at all, might statues be used um, as pedagogical tools, either in public space or after they fall? Um, and uh, I mean, another example comes from Sami Penarbasi, um, who uh, is a leader of the Repeal Peel campaign um, against the statue of Robert Peel in Manchester. Um, so what should happen to, to statues like that? Um, statues of Peel, statues of um, people with few rules in um, imperialism and colonization. Um, once, they, once they fall, if they fall, what happens next? Uh, so this time, let's see, uh, Alistair, would you like to start? Okay, um, so I mean the classic kind of comparison is like where where are all the statues of Hitler right now, right? You know they're locked away in a warehouse because they are not fit for society. It's as simple as that. If everybody carried a, a common opinion on why the statues of slave traders should be removed, then they would un there would be a common opinion of why they shouldn't be in the public forum. Yeah, so that the, the statue itself isn't the issue, is it? At the end of the day, it's it's people's um, misunderstanding of what that statue means in that immediate environment. So, I think that's the way to tackle that. I think for me is to actually replace um, that concern, um, you know, with with raising the question. Um, and if we can convey the question in in a positive way that engages them, then they might reach the right answer. Thanks. And I see that Simokai has raised his hand. Um, so Simokai. Sorry, I raised it by accident, but I'll, 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 I'll just say something briefly. Um, you know, I hadn't actually spent a lot of time thinking about um, statues in a very systematic way before Rhodes Must Fall. I kind of just took it for granted, I think because I grew up in Zimbabwe, I kind of took it for granted that um, statuary and public memorials are constantly in flux. So as I was growing up, you know, street names were changed, statues came up and they went down. Because this, we, we was, I was part of the born free generation, the first generation of Zimbabweans born after colonialism. So it seemed to me a really strange thing to then be in a context where um, statues are imagined by some to exist uh, for time immemorial, you know, for all the reasons that we've, we've already said. But something that did strike me, and it kind of builds on, on one of Alistair's earlier points about the accusation of erasing history kind of being pushed back by an argument about making history. I think in a kind of parochial sense with the Rhodes statue, you know, during the Black Lives Matter protests, the range of kind of posters and placards of photographs of debates and so on that were generated all around the city was something that I had never seen before. Um, and I'd been in touch with some folks in one of the museums where they'd started to, to carry and to, to store up the placards that had um, emerged during the protests and had been left behind. And it kind of, I just wanted just with a little bit more imagination, creating an exhibition around Rhodes that is both about the history of Rhodes and the history of colonialism and empire that he represented, but also the history of Rhodes Must Fall. And I think it's about changing the kind of visual culture that marks the university and perhaps reframing it within a new idiom. And for me, this sense of erasing history, making history, perhaps the, the appropriate idiom is about a kind of dynamism, a sense that um, part of, you know, to give Oxford University a degree of credit here, that instead of seeing its kind of legacy and endurance as being um, a kind of uh, static commitment to all that has gone before, reimagining it as a place capable of constant reinvention as it does become more globalized and as it does, you know, I know that's not kind of the reality, but that then becomes a kind of positive vision for what the place could be. And I think taking down the statue then could become part of that project. And so I've become really sort of interested in thinking of visual culture as something kind of dynamic and iteratively reflective of history being made in real time. And also about how we constantly seek to imagine the future, not only thinking about a kind of reverence for the past. 
Great. Thanks. Um, Gary, uh, do you have comments on this question about the statues yeah. themselves? Yeah, I do. I I um, I think that the ones that museums want should go to museums. I don't. I don't think you should um, force them on museums. Could be the museums. <laughs> we don't. We actually. No, thank you. But that um, <clears throat> I would not be offended. Um, and, and what was interesting when I did the hay, the talk at hay was a number of what I would call what about questions. So kind of what about street names? What about portraits? And, and um, you know, portraits, I said, well, what I said in the moment was, well, look, when you go to the National Portrait Gallery, you know what you're getting. They're not sitting outside. I don't think I would have a problem with seeing Edward Colston's portrait in the National Portrait Gallery. I'd want it to be properly uh, uh, labeled, but the idea that he would, you know, that he or somebody else who was awful would be there um, uh, wouldn't surprise me. There's a, but there's a real difference between that and having them as a kind of uh, have them having them publicly present. And that, um, so you go to a museum that, you know, there's one in Budapest, I think there's one in India. Um, where you know you're going to see old statues, and the, and there will be you know little things saying when they were taken down and why they were taken down. Uh, you know, I think that I'd go visit that, um, and it seems to me that that would be the best kind of that would be the most logical uh, place for them to go. And I am mindful of this fear of losing things. <laughs> That um, uh, that people have, and I think it's also kind of, you know, sensitive to that. There was some real um, interesting artwork was done in the Ukraine. I'm just looking at his name, Niels Ackerman, who travelled across the Ukraine taking pictures of where the Lenin statues had ended up, and they ended up in like weird cupboards and kind of um, uh, used car, you know, used car places and in all sorts of and you know in fields and in people's front gardens and all sorts of weird uh, uh, places and the fact that they had been taken down and transformed it actually transformed their meaning it was no longer it was an emblem somehow uh, and that's about the kind of that's about whether the politics can work with these things but I think as a baseline trying to find a museum for them. And maybe the same museum for all of them would not be such a bad thing. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Ines, uh, what are your thoughts on what should happen to the statues themselves? Um, so I like Gary's point that there are a huge, you know, a range of different options for what can happen with the statue. Um, I actually don't have a clear answer myself. And the reason why is because I don't think that is, it's my decision. I don't think it's the decision of Rosemus Fall. I don't think it's the decision of the commission or Oriel or the university. Um, but I think actually the decision should be deferred to the local community because it's the local community that can test this statue that have to deal with the repercussions in the in the day-to-day -day kind of life and i think there's this is often overlooked and sometimes um, my concern is that sometimes kind of discussions about statues can be uh, reduced to academic and intellectual debates and that is very problematic because it is a lived it's a lived experience it's, lived reality of what it actually means for people. And from my experience in Rosemus Fall, the commission um, did not uh, reach out to the local community. And this was a huge, huge downfall uh, to, its re to, to its whole process, even though, yes, it recommended that they should take it down, which is obviously aligned with what we want. But the way that it went about it is very problematic. And I think, that is something that shouldn't be overlooked. It often is. 
and the community really should be at the heart of the decision making. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not in a position to decide, but I defer. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, very important point. Um, and so often in discussions of roads must fall in particular, um, the local community is completely omitted from the discussion, particularly in media representations, I think, of, of that movement. Uh, so several of the other questions um, uh, deal with um, uh, other examples that, uh, that we could learn from, other movements, other countries. Um, all of you actually have mentioned other countries um, in, uh, in your comments. Alistair mentioned um, that there are no statues of Hitler um, displayed publicly in Germany. Gary mentioned the Ukraine and post-Soviet statues. Um, Simukai mentioned changing street names being the, the norm really in Zimbabwe. Um, so, uh, I, and there are you know, a couple of other examples. Leah Becknell, um, uh, mentions how other European countries are dealing with their colonial history. And Selena Gayo Cruz um, talks about a, a, a mural at the University of New Mexico um, of Spanish colonizers um, educating inverted commas um, and enlightening indigenous peoples. Um, so, really, maybe another way of, of thinking about this question would be um, what alternative ways um, of commemoration um, do we know of from other examples, or could we imagine? Um, if there are no um, examples to emulate um, in these other uh, case studies that you've mentioned, what other types of, um, of commemoration um, could you imagine? Uh, let's see, I should, <laughs> rather than letting it hang in the air, I should call on someone specifically. Uh, Gary, would you like to go first? Um, well, just a few examples, good examples. In Montgomery, Alabama, the most powerful uh, piece of public art is outside the Southern Poverty Law Center and it's um, it's water over granite. And it takes a, uh, a quote from King saying um, uh, oh, something about, and righteousness like a mighty stream or something like that. And it's just a, it's just a very powerful symbol. And it's, I remember that before I remember the statue of Rosa Parks. Um, if I think of the uh, Vietnam War Memorial, which is also, I think, very powerful. And you can, you can see yourself in it, and the, and it's just names. Um, um, the Holocaust Memorial in Germany. So, I think, I think when um, uh, moments are remembered, and particularly moments you can engage with, or memorials you can engage with, so where you can touch them and kind of. And kids can climb on them, and um, with it, you know, without disrespecting them, and um, uh, and and it, and in a sense, it's one of my kind of main arguments about statues in general is that they're very lazy, and they're not very engaging. Um, so, I think there are there are once one broadens your scope, actually, there's some quite good pieces of public art out there that don't focus on the individual, but instead on the moment or the group or the theme. And um, uh, they're, really, um, they're really quite effective. I find them more effective um, than, than the statues of people. Uh, Simokai, what do you think? Either about other examples or about, well, both and really, other examples uh, that could be emulated um, or other imaginations. Um, of commemoration? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, I'll give one example because uh, it's kind of really pertinent to Rosemont's Fall, which was um, in 2015, um, I had gone back to Zimbabwe to do field research for my doctorate um, before sort of coming back and participating in, in a lot of the activism. And as it was brewing, I was taking some friends of mine around Zimbabwe uh, visiting different tourist sites. And we were in Matabeleland and went to see Rhodes's grave. Um, and I'd actually, I'd been there as a kid and I could not remember it. And so it was the first time kind of going as an, as an adult. Um, and it's kind of interesting the way they did it. So it's in a national, what is effectively a national park. And 
I think Rhodes envisioned, you know, I mean, the, the actual spot where it is is atop this hill and you have a stunning view of the landscape and of the balancing rocks and so on. And it was quite in keeping um, with his own narcissism that he should be buried in such an idyllic spot in land that he conquered. But they've created, they've left the actual site untouched, but created um, a kind of museum um, around it. So you pay money to the national park. And as you walk in, you have to go through a museum that talks initially about Rhodes and his action in Matabela land and expands it out into the wider history of Zimbabwe and then of anti-colonial struggle. And it has that quality that kind of Gary was alluding to about something that you can interact with. That's not sort of passive, it's just a, a lazy artifact that's sitting there. And you know, there's been a lot of ambivalence in the country about whether or not you take it down. And because of its kind of physical location, it, you know, they can't really exhume it. You can't really take it down, but you can totally reappropriate what it stands for. And so it does, it no longer carries that same sense of the final resting place of this imperialist, but rather it becomes this kind of, I guess, gateway or entry point into trying to understand, um, you know, a key figure who feeds into the kind of finding myth of what Zimbabwe was first as a colony and what it has become since then. Um, so that's kind of an interesting one to me. I know it doesn't directly sort of resolve the, the question of, of statues per se, but that sense of something interactive and an actual educational tool that by its very design means you have to engage with it. Okay, thanks, Simoka. Uh, Inas, um, what about uh, your thoughts on alternative uh, ways of imagining commemoration um, or existing ones elsewhere? I really like the examples that Sumikai and Gary gave. Um, and I think actually, yes, if you're being interactive and engaging, it forces the individual to you know, reflect and assess what that means to them. And that is, I think, the kind of education that is very critical and crucial to understanding, yes, your identity and to understanding other people, where other people are placed in relation to you. And so I very much support this, this interactive element. Great, thanks. And Alice there, um, how about your thoughts? Sure. Um, I, think, um, I think with statues, the difficult angle is the permanency of it as well. You know, uh, it's it's something that is is put in its sitting in its setting and walked away from in the largest part. Um, there's generally very little context other than that, and especially when it's commemorating somebody, a figurehead, and and without that knowledge, then it's it's difficult to see any kind of success through what from where where it's what its intent was. You know, um, it's easy when there's no contention, I guess, around um, what that person represented in their lifetime when they're celebrated. Um, but I think, um, I think you have to kind of think about whether something should be a bit more temporal or permanent. You know, for me, it, 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 it kind of goes back to when Jen's statue went up and it was 100% intended to be a fully temporary piece of artwork just simply to raise questions and spark or in, just keep that presence of the movement in the public eye. Um, I'm drifting a little bit from the commemorative um, issue or the topic, I should say. Um, I love the idea of interaction as well. Um, public spaces are, are places that should be shared as well. You know, um, you know where better to do that where uh, other than somewhere that you're actually performing an activity in some way together. Um, it could be friends, it can be family. And that's, a really, you know, parks have always been the classic way of doing that, um, whether it's a kid's park or an age park. Um, so, yeah, I, other than that, I find statues quite difficult to swallow myself, um, um, <laughs> you know, despite my close links. Um, so, so I'm, I'm pushing more in the direction of more temporary artwork um, to keep the questions that I think need to be in the social forefront. 
present. Great, thanks Alistair. Um, so lots of very creative ideas um, and lots of global um, ideas um, of how to imagine commemoration differently and by extension to imagine the present and the future um, differently. Um, so and we only have five minutes left and I think rather than trying to answer every question, um, apologies for those that, uh, that I wasn't able to get to uh, today. Um, and I imagine that many of the answers have raised additional questions, um, but this isn't the end of the conversation either. Um, but with the last few minutes that we have, um, why don't we go uh, around one more time to the panelists and have you share any final thoughts that you have um, before we close the panel um, about themes that have been raised, um, about reflections, um, on this conversation, um, maybe about where we go from here, um, it's possible in this time. Uh, and why don't we go in the reverse order that we started out with? Um, so Gary, you have final thoughts for us? Um, I will try and be brief. I mean, two things. First would be the Frederick Douglass quote that power concedes nothing without a demand, never has it and never will. The, uh, just to emphasize that it was the mass movement politics outside of this that made it possible. And so when we talk and think about what we want to happen, we have to understand that us wanting it and arguing for it isn't enough. We have to kind of cohere a significant number of people uh, uh, in that direction. Um, and, that, and that the direction is a broad one. You know, it's not the direction won't be about statues, as people have said. And I guess the the other thing is that kind of, um, I do just want to emphasize, um, and other people have alluded to, building something beyond taking it down. Like what 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 do we want to create? We know what we don't like. We don't have to agree on what we want to create, but we have to have some kind of um hopeful vision that we can share um that isn't just about removing things and taking things away but what we add what we build what we grow that's great thank you gary um alistair what are your final thoughts um, for everyone sure i guess um yeah for me i'd uh, i i think we have to look a little bit outside of the current system uh, um, in as much as we've got the public and the system. Um, alongside that, or in a, we have in business and industry and they could play a key role in moving forward. And I know for a fact through connections I have in very large companies that the measures that they're already putting in place to try and tackle some of these issues positively um, but it's not very public and, and my issue is that you know more people can t use the platform that they have to engage the public in a very public way um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks Alistair. Uh, Ines uh, what are your final thoughts? So going forward we need to look beyond statues um, as has been said many times throughout this uh, panel. And, you know, I think one element of this is that the different movements across the world, not just uh, in Oxford or in the UK, but really across the world need to have stronger ties together. And I think, you know, it's, I mean, it's of course very difficult geographically, but I think this is something that's super, super crucial, um, considering that, you know, institutions work by breaking movements down by making them smaller. And so, you know, since there are, the movements across the world are aligned, we need to find ways of connecting a lot more uh, kind of in a deep rooted way and more cohesively and kind of communicate with each other about goals and what we can do together and how, what we can kind of uh, organize together. And I think, you know, through this also, it will by default move the discussion away from statues, not just within the debate that we're having, but even for institutions as well, because it's something that they can, 
they, come, they cannot reduce it to just one statue, to one city. It's faced, they're faced a lot more with the realities of the systemic oppression that we're trying to address. Thanks, Inas. And the final word goes to Simokai. Undeservedly so, but um, <laughs> um, I think that, I mean, maybe the only thing I'd add is that um, my experience of Rhodes Must Fall has really made me alive to, I think, some of the cynicism that's built into a lot of the pushback against these kinds of movements. So um, I remember being us being accused in 2015 and 2016 of no platforming the statue, which just made no sense to me. Uh, if they said no plinth thing, I might have kind of got that, but there was like no platforming the statue. And then now it's kind of cancel culture and it's, it's kind of this phantom enemy of um, a, a certain articulation or vision of a liberal ideology that is presented as fundamentally sort of demonic and threatening to a particular version of what uh, British cultural identity should be. And I guess being alive to the fact that that um, cynicism often used by those in power serves many different functions. It is a distraction. It is a tool to reduce the legitimacy um, of these sorts of arguments. Um, and it can keep kind of focus a bit narrow on artifacts, even as much as we're saying that this is about statues, but it's also about more than statues. And so I think this kind of cultural activism is really important as it's trying to pierce through the fog of kind of distortion, denialism and misrepresentation uh, that comes with those who are for whatever reason, kind of cynically trying to um, co-opt anti-racist movements into some false notion of a culture war. Thanks, and that note on the promise of cultural activism and the importance of cultural activism is a wonderful note to end on um, and a wonderful note to end the conference on. Uh, so thank you um, to Simokai, to Inas, to uh, Gary and to Alistair and to Joanna um, for uh, their wonderful provocative thoughts. Uh, thank you, Luke, um, for your help with facilitating. Um, and on behalf of the organizing committee, um, Kevin, Simon, Luke, Nero, and myself, um, thank you to all of the attendees of AFPP. It's been a wonderful conference. I hope that the discussion doesn't end here, that we continue to have these conversations. The movements are still very much alive. Um, and uh, uh, thank you once again, everyone. Um, enjoy your evening. Uh, bye.